Yes, Lance. It's been years since I've heard anything from you. You must come down to Soju Island. We have so much to talk about. Besides, it is the most enchanting place where you can be in communion with nature, bask in the sunshine, and have a good time recalling the good old days. I suggest you take the 1240 train from Paddington next weekend. I'll send someone to come pick you up from Oak Bridge. Yours always, Constance Comiton. The mysterious soldier island. Lady Constance is true to her style. <laughs> Dear Miss Claythorne, I received your name from the Skilled Women's Agency together with their recommendation. I understand that they know you personally. I shall be very glad to pay this salary ask, and shall expect you to take up your duties on August 8th. The train is at 12.40 from Paddington, and you'll be met at Oakbridge Station. I enclose five one-pound notes for expenses. This chap looks like he's traveled the world. She's quite attractive. A bit school mistressy, perhaps. I'd love to take her on. What am I doing? I've got to be on the job. It is rather strange, being off of money to spend a week on an island. Ah well. I fancy I'm going to enjoy Soldier Island. <laughs> I do hope you remember me. We were together at Bellhaven Guesthouse in August some years ago, and we seem to have so much in common. I am starting a guesthouse on my own, on an island off the coast of Devon. I should be very glad if you could come spend your summer holiday on Soto Island. <laughs> as long as there is good English cooking and no loud music. <laughs> I hope you'll excuse formal invitation. One or two of your cronies are coming. Would like to have a talk over old times. Sounds rather nice. I was beginning to think fellas was fighting shy of me. All from that damned rumor. Amatash must have talked. But what did he know about it? Worried about his wife's health and wants a report without her being alarmed. She won't hear of a doctor, he says. Her nerves. <laughs> These women and their nerves, I swear. They're the only reason I'm still in business. What the? Damn young fool! <laughs> oh, the amount of cars crawling about the roads is frightful. Always something blocking your way. And they'll drive in the middle of the road. Pretty hopeless driving in England anyway. Not like France, where you can really let out. Alright, that's the law. Emily Brent, Vera Claythorne, Dr. Armstrong, Anthony Marston, Old Justice Walgrave, Philip Lombard, General MacArthur, CMG DSO, plus uh, Manservant and White, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers. I went over the eight. Job ought to be easy enough. <coughs> the name's Davis. Davis from South Africa. South Africa. Natal, since you ask. We'll be getting to Stigalaven soon, Mr. Davis. You going to Soju Island? Aye. That stinking piece of rock teeming with gulls. I was a small boy when I last came here. This time I've been invited with seven other people. Watch and pray, young man. Watch and pray. The day of judgment is near. He's closer to judgment than I am. Passengers for Soldier Island, please. So, Miss Cleethorne, you've been hired as a secretary by Mr. and Mrs. Owen. That's right, Mr. Lombard. Philip Lombard. I lived in Devon in my later years in life, but I never traveled to this island before. Did you see that spinster in the other taxi? She looks every bit the old nanny of our host. And that reptilian looking man with her. 
It scares me. I think I've seen it before. He's Justice Walgrave of the Queen's Bench. Retired, if I'm not mistaken. This way, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's a very small boat. Oh, she's a fine boat, that ma'am. You could go to Plymouth and her as easy as winking. There's a good many of us. She'll take double the number, sir. The name's Davis. South Africa. It must be difficult to land here in dirty weather. Can't land here when there's a southeasterly. Sometimes it's cut off for a week or more. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Soju Island. I'm Rogers and this is my wife. Your hosts, Mr. and Mrs. Owen, have been unavoidably delayed, but they'll be here tomorrow. If you'd like to go to your rooms, dinner will be at 8 o'clock. I hope you have everything you need, miss. I'm fine, thank you. I'm Mrs. Owen's new secretary. I expect you know that. Oh no, miss. I don't know anything. She hasn't mentioned me. I, I haven't seen Mrs. Owen. Not yet. We only came here two days ago. How many staff are there here? Uh, just me and my husband, miss. If you want anything, just ring the bell. What a strange woman. Drinks are in the hall. Uh, thank you. I must go and pay my respects to my hosts and hostess. You can't do that. Well, why not? No host and hostess. Very curious state of affairs. I don't understand this place. Is Lady Constance comment unexpected, do you know? But uh, no, sir. Not to my knowledge. Soldier Island, eh? There is a fly in the ointment. I suppose I must go through with it. The heathen are sunken down into the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. The wicked shall be turned into hell. These little china statues are peculiar, aren't they? Soldiers? Soldier Island? I suppose that's the idea. How funny! They're the ten little soldier boys of the nursery rhyme. The one that's hanging in my room. In my room, too. And mine. It seems we all have one. Quite amusing, isn't it? Utterly childish, I'd say. So, Mr. Davis, where did you say that you were from in South Africa? Natal, since you ask. Really? Because I've been there myself and... Ladies and gentlemen, silence, please. You are charged with the following crime. Edward George Armstrong, that you did upon the 14th day of March, 1940. 
1925 caused the death of Louisa Mary Cleese. William Henry Law. That you brought about the death of James Stephen Landor on October 10th, 1928. Emily Caroline Brent. That upon the 5th of November, 1931, you were responsible for the death of Beatrice Taylor. Vera Elizabeth Claythorne. That on the 11th day of August, 1935, you killed Cyril Ogilvie Hamilton. Philip Lombard. That upon a date in February 1932, you were guilty of the death of 21 men, members of an East African tribe. John Gordon MacArthur. That on the 4th of January 1917, you deliberately sent your wife's lover, Arthur Richmond, to his death. Anthony James Marston. That upon the 14th day of November last, you were guilty of the murder of John and Lucy Combs. Thomas Rogers and Ethel Rogers. That on the 6th of May, 1929, you brought about the death of Jennifer Brady. Lawrence John Wargrave. That upon the 10th day of June, 1930, you were guilty of the murder of Edward Seaton. Prisoners at the bar, have you anything to say in your defense? <laughs> Uh, it's nothing. She's just fainted. She'll be alright. Oh, it was that voice. It was like judgment. Uh, Rogers, get her some brandy. It'll buck her up. What's going on here? What kind of a tasteless joke was that? That voice. It sounded as though it were in here with us. Unless... <laughs> Look! A gramophone! You killed Sarah Turn it off! It's Alfred. horrible! Seems someone was playing a practical joke. Well, that remains to be seen. Who put that record on the gramophone? I did, sir. But I was just obeying Mr. Owens' orders. I thought it was just a piece of music. Had I known what it was... Is there a title on the record? <laughs> of course. It says Swan Song. The whole thing is preposterous. This fellow Owen, whoever he is... That's just it. Who is he? That is exactly what we must find out. The first scene's first, Rogers. I suggest you take your wife to her room. She needs rest. Now I'll give you a hand, Rogers. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I reckon we could all do with a drink. I shall have a glass of water. Now that voice spoke to us all by name, but it also spoke of a William Henry Blaw. None of us is called Blaw. But Davis's name wasn't mentioned. What have you to say about that, Mr. Davis? Well, cat's out of the bag, it seems. Well, I better admit my name isn't Davis. I'm William Blow, XCRD. I knew as much. You never said foot anywhere near Natal. Davis was a false name Mr. Owen asked me to adopt. He hired me to join the party and keep a watch on his wife's jewels. Mr. Owen seems to be quite the trickster. I've given her a sedative. She'll be sleeping peacefully tonight. Now, Rogers, we must get to the bottom of this. Who is Mr. Owen? Well, I can't say, sir. You see, I've never met him. My wife and I were recruited through an agency. We got this letter with instructions on how to prepare the house before your arrival. Hmm. Typewritten from the Ritz Hotel. Signed, Ulick Norman Owen. That's strange. I thought it was Una Nancy Owen. You're quite right, Miss Claythorne. It seems that we've been invited here by a madman who calls himself U.N. Owen. Or, by a slight stretch, unknown. An anonymous lunatic. Anonymous, eh? Now let us proceed to the next part of our inquiry. <clears throat> My invitation came from an old friend of mine, asking me to join her here on this island. I suppose you all received something similar, sent by friends, relatives, colleagues. One thing is for certain, our host knows quite a lot about us. 
which explains those terrible accusations. It's wicked and malicious! I would just like to say something. I've been accused of sending Edward Seaton to his death. Seaton was brought before me in trial, charged with murder. He was very well defended, and the jury seemed to like him. However, on the evidence, he was clearly guilty. I reminded the jury of the evidence, and they passed a guilty verdict. Subsequently, Seaton was duly sentenced to hang. Yet I must admit, I had trouble placing where I've seen you from. Now I remember. That trial was in all of the papers. Everyone was quite certain that Seaton was innocent. Pure speculation. I knew. And what's more is my conscience is perfectly clear on the matter. I... I was nursery governess to that child, Cyril Hamilton. He was forbidden to swim out far. He wasn't strong enough. But one day when my attention was distracted, he slipped away. I swam after him, but I couldn't get there in time. It wasn't my fault. The coroner exonerated me. Even his mother didn't blame me. This accusation is so unfair. There's absolutely no truth in these accusations. Young Arthur Richmond was one of my officers. I had sent him on a reconnaissance mission and he was killed in combat. It's a natural course of events in wartime. But what I truly resent is the slur about my wife. She was the best woman in the world, my Leslie. About those natives, I'm afraid the story is quite true. We were lost in the bush, East Africa. I knew there was no chance we'd all make it out, so I took the food and cleared out. The way I saw it, it was either them or me. I know it wasn't a very noble thing to do, but it was self-preservation. Besides, they were only natives. They don't think about dying the way Europeans do. Yes, I left them to die. You know, I've just been thinking. John and Lucy Combs. They must have been the couple of kids I ran over near Cambridge. It was beastly bad luck. For them? Or for you? Well, I suppose for them. They ran out into the middle of the road. And I lost my license for about six months. Terrible nuisance. Speeding is what makes men like you a danger to the community. Cars nowadays are designed for speed. But English roads are hopeless. You can't get a good pace up on them. Anyway, it wasn't my fault. It was only an accident. Might I say a word? Go ahead, Rogers. My wife and I, we were working for Miss Brady. She was always in poor health, even before we came to her. On the night she died, she was seriously ill. There was a storm and the telephone was out of order. So I went on the foot to get the doctor, but it was too late. We've done everything. We've tried our best to save her. And there was never a word said against us. Not one. And she left you a tidy sum of money in recognition of your services, eh? I was the police officer in charge of a bank robbery case. Landor had killed the night watchman. On my testimony, he was convicted and set up for life. Died in prison. But it had nothing to do with me. I was only doing my duty. <laughs> How convenient. And what about you, Doctor? Professional mistake or illegal operation? I must admit, mine is a mystery to me. I don't even remember anyone called Cleese. Uh, probably a patient who died. You must understand, not all surgeries are successful, you know. Care for whiskey, Doctor? Yeah. No, uh, thank you. I hope you're not expecting me to say anything. I have nothing to say. Do you reserve your defense, Miss Brent? It is not a question of defense. I have always followed my conscience. I have nothing to blame myself for. How interesting. Out of everybody, I seem to be the only one who is not a law-abiding citizen. Our inquiry ends there. Now, Rogers. Who else is there on this island? Nobody, sir. Nobody at all. I am not yet clear as to why our host has gathered us all here, but in my opinion, he is not sane in any sense of the word. I suggest we leave this place as soon as possible. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but it's not possible. There's no boat on the island. We get our supplies from Narricot. He comes every morning with the groceries, the post, and then goes back immediately afterwards. All right, then. We leave tomorrow as soon as the boat arrives. 
Now, we can't just run away. We should solve this mystery before we go. It's like a detective story. Positively thrilling. In my time of life, Mr. Marston, I have no desire for thrills. The league of life is narrowing. I'm all for crime. Here's to it. God, he's dead. But do you mean that he just choked to death? Well, you can call it choking if you like. He died from asphyxiation, right enough. I never knew a man could die from a mere choking fit. In the midst of life, we are in death. His death isn't what you'd call normal. Was there something in his glass? Yes, one of the cyanides, possibly potassium. Instantly fatal. The whiskey and the soda water both smell all right. Could he have put the poison in the glass himself? I wonder. Leslie, my darling, I loved you so. Why did you have that affair with Richmond? I wasn't sorry when I sent him on that mission. I knew he wouldn't survive, but that was so long ago. If it wasn't Armitage, then who? Miss Brent? Of course. One of the old boys in the regiment was called Brent. That's strange. I could have sworn there were ten of these. Sarah, you can't. It's too far. You know I love you, Vera, but I can't marry you. I'm penniless. It's not fair that Cyril is inheriting his father's fortunes. He's a nice kid, but if my brother had left me the money, you and I could... Well, that's life. Hugo, why do I feel you're so near me tonight? Somewhere close. How drunk I've been. I shouldn't be performing an operation this drunk. Ah, oh, it's no good. The woman is dead. Well, now we need to find out. It's awfully hot in here. Why is the nurse staring at me? No. No, it, it can't be. Not Emily Doctor. Brent! Doctor! <laughs> Doctor, wake up! What's the matter? It's the wife, sir. She doesn't look right to me. Well, go ahead, I'll follow you. Well, is she? Yes, uh, I'm afraid she's gone. What could have caused it? I don't know. Did she take anything to sleep at night? Nothing, sir. Except what you gave her. But it couldn't have been that. It couldn't. No. I suppose not. Has everyone finished breakfast? Very well. I thought it best to wait until afterwards before I shared some sad news. <clears throat> Mrs. Rogers died in her sleep last night. Oh, how awful. Two deaths since we've arrived. Heart failure? Heart certainly failed to beat, but what caused it to fail I cannot say. Divine retribution. She and her husband killed that old lady. 
It was an act of God. My dear lady, in my experience in cases of ill-doing, providence leaves the work of conviction and chastisement to us mortals. The process is often fraught with difficulty. There are no shortcuts. You know, I've been thinking. Suppose she and her husband did kill their mistress. As soon as they're found out, she goes to pieces. You think Rogers would just sit there and let her give the game away? No. No. A man wouldn't kill his wife, no matter how guilty she was. I thought the boat would have come by now. Well, I was hoping it would come sooner. That wind's picking up. Not to my liking. The boat won't come regardless. How do you mean? I reckon it's part of the plan. No one's coming for us. No one is leaving the island. Finally, we'll have peace. Oh my god, what's the matter? The soldier boys! Last night, I thought that there were nine after what happened, and now there are only eight. Just like there were eight of us. You seemed very quiet last night, Miss Brent. I didn't want to say anything in front of those gentlemen last night, but if you must know, Beatrice Taylor used to work for me. As I found out too late, she was indecent. It turned out she got herself in trouble, as they say. Naturally, I dismissed her. I would not have kept her one moment longer under my roof. What happened to her? With nowhere to go, she threw herself into a river and drowned. Didn't you feel bad? If you hadn't, her sins drove her to do it. Nothing to do with me. Why should I feel any remorse? So what do you think about what I said earlier? Well, I mean, if Rogers had killed his wife, then they really did do what they're accused of. But how could they have gotten away with it after all this time? I asked him about the lady they looked after. And, well, in elementary terms, Miss Brady suffered a cardiac condition which could be subdued by inhaling a broken capsule of amyl nitrate. However, if this medication were withheld, the consequences could be fatal. Sounds simple enough. And a thing like that can't be proven. Precisely. As for Mrs. Rogers, well, here's how I see it. I could believe in Rogers killing his wife, or possibly that she committed suicide, if it hadn't been for Marston. Two suicides in 12 hours, that's rather hard to swallow, isn't it? How so? Well, isn't it obvious? Marston never would have committed suicide. He was simply amoral about the whole thing. He and Mrs. Rogers were murdered. Killed by someone who's got it into their head to do justice. Justice? Uh, think about it. The negation of medicine, the hit-and-run accidents. All of the accusations made last night were based on crimes committed within the limits of the law. None of them were the result of a direct act, but of circumstances created by stupidity and, and cowardice greed or jealousy of the perpetrators. And you and Owen, our unknown soldier, wants us to pay for our crimes in the only way possible. It's an insane thought, but even if that were the case, Rogers said we're alone here. If Owen is siding somewhere waiting for his next target, then we'll have to search the island from top to bottom. This island is more or less a bare rock. We'll make short work of fighting him. Now, he may be dangerous, Dangerous. <laughs> I'll be dangerous when I catch him. Are you here waiting for the boat, General? I'm waiting for the end of it all. I'm sorry? I loved Leslie very much. Was she your wife? Yes. That is why I sent Richmond to his death. In a way, I suppose it was murder. At the time, it seemed different. And it seemed to work fine. I didn't think Leslie would suspect. But afterwards, she grew distant from me. Then she died, and I was all alone. <laughs> Funny. I always loved Devon. 
but I'd never thought I'd die here. You'll be glad too when the time comes. I don't know what you mean. You will. When it comes, it'll be a blessed relief. When you no longer have to carry the burden. My poor dear Leslie. Any luck? No. No caves, no hiding places. Yellen is completely isolated. And there's no secret passageways in the house. We appear to be alone here. Perhaps it was merely coincidence after all. Doctor, not to mince words, but last night, you did give Mrs. Rogers something to make her sleep, right? By any chance, you didn't give her an overdose, did you? The amount I gave her couldn't have hurt anyone. But could it have been a mistake? Doctors can't afford to make mistakes of that kind. Wouldn't be your first time if that gramophone's to be believed. Now look here, Blore. We are all in the same boat and we ought to stick together. Before you start making accusations, we can ask you the same thing about your testimony. Perhaps a little bit of perjury? And what about you, Lombard? Who brings a revolver to a tourist retreat? <sighs> I was instructed to bring in and to inspect trouble. I wasn't invited here like the rest of you. I was offered money by some lawyer named Isaac Morris. He told me to come to the island and keep my eyes open. But now it seems that the money was just Mr. Owen's little bit of cheese to get me into this trap with the rest of you. Uh, lunch will be served in a minute, ladies and gentlemen. I hope no one objects to cold meat and salad. Has anyone seen the general? I saw him down by the sea. I'll fetch him. He may not have heard the gun. The weather is getting rough. There are white horses out on the sea. Maybe that's why the boat hasn't come yet. What other reason would he not come? Doctor? General MacArthur is dead. Miss, I just came to see... Yes, Mr. Rogers, see for yourself. There are only seven left. Well, no questions of accidents or heart failures. He was hit on the back of the head with a blunt object. General MacArthur was murdered. And it seems clear on where we are. And gentlemen, I watched you searching the island for a potential murderer. Doubtless you came to the same conclusion I did, that there is some self-proclaimed lover of justice on the island who is talking to us all. You and Owen. But we searched the island from end to end. There is no one else here, I tell you, no one. And yet Mr. Owen is on this island. Believe in us all guilty of crimes which the law cannot touch, he has appointed himself to execute justice. And after enticing us to this island, there's only one way in which justice can be accomplished. As he could have only come to this island one way, it's quite clear. Mr. Owen is one of us. No. No! This is not the time to refuse facts in the face. We are all in danger. Of the ten of us that came to this island, three are definitely cleared of suspicion. The three victims. The notion that I should take the life of a fellow creature, let alone three, is absurd. But I can appreciate that we are all equally under suspicion. Now the question is, who do we suspect the most? Lombard's got a revolver. He didn't tell us last night. He admits it. I've already explained myself to you, so what good will it do to say it again? We're all in the same position. We've only got our own word to go upon. But I know for certain that I am not the murderer. Neither am I. I am a well-known professional, and the very idea... I too am a well-known man, but that means nothing. Doctors and judges have gone mad in the past, and so have policemen. Well, at any rate, I suppose you'll leave the women out of it. 
Aren't women capable of homicidal mania? A woman could have easily have committed these three murders. I think you've gone mad. We are all strangers to each other, Miss Clayfall. And until we have proof, no one is above suspicion. We were all present at the time of Marston's death, and any one of us could have gone into Mrs. Rochester's room and given her poison. Any one of us could have gone down and killed the general. There is a murderer amongst us. All we can do is try and establish contact with the mainland. But until then, it'll be our task to suspect each and every one. Take no risks and trust no one. There is danger everywhere. I can scarcely believe it. We've just got to keep our heads. If it is one of them, who do you think it is? Oh, exempting you and I. I'll take that as a compliment. You've already admitted you don't hold human life as sacred. Somehow that makes me trust you more. I'm sure you would never do such a thing either. You seem incredibly sane to me. But old Justice Wargrave, he thinks he's judge and jury. Who do you suspect? Dr. Armstrong. <laughs> no hesitation. Two of the three deaths were poison, and he went to get the general. He could say that the man's been dead an hour, and we couldn't contradict him. All the possibilities are plausible. It's enough to drive anyone crazy. We must get out of here. I don't profess to be a weather prophet, but even if we manage to get a message to the coast, I don't think a boat would be able to pick us up with this storm brewing. And by the time they do, we'll all be murdered in our beds. I hope not. Unlike the first three victims, we are forewarned and know what to expect. Moreover, I think I know who the culprit is. I need your help. Shall I pour? If you don't mind, me, dear. I'm so tired and I lost my great ball of wool. Very annoying. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Does anyone know what's become of the bathroom curtain? What's this nonsense now, Rogers? It's gone, sir. A scarlet oil silk curtain. Honestly, Rogers, who cares? Certainly is mad, but so is everything else. Since you can't kill anyone with a scarlet curtain or great ball of wool, just forget it. Let's just go to bed. It's been an exhausting day. I need hardly advise you to lock your doors properly. And put a chair under the handle. There are ways of turning locks from the outside. Good night, gentlemen. May we all meet safely in the morning. There. No one will touch the little soldiers tonight. What time is it? 9.30. I figured someone would have woken us by now. Rogers? Exactly. I just knocked on Miss Brent's door and she's not there either. <gasps> the rain is stopped, but the sea is as high as ever. I doubt any boat could reach us. Have you seen Rogers? No. Why? We can't find him. And I think we'd better find him soon. I've just been to the dining room. It's all set for breakfast. So? He could have done that last night. And only six little soldier boys on the table. <gasps> oh my god! The rhyme! One chopped himself in half and then there were six! Do, do you think they keep bees on this island? The next verse is six little soldiers playing with a hive. <gasps> It's funny, isn't it? Isn't it funny? <laughs> uh, calm down. We already have enough problems. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Miss Brent and I will go make breakfast. Would it have taken great strength, Doctor? Well, a woman could have done it if that's what you mean. The girl easily. Miss Brent looks fragile, but the criminally insane have uh, quite the strength.
Old Miss Brent is as mad as a hatter. She's got religious mania, sitting in a room reading her Bible all the time. She could have done any one of these killings. But religious mania doesn't prove anything, Law. But I'm glad to see that you don't suspect me anymore. Now ah, the revolver's what did it for me. But at the same time, it seemed too obvious. I hope you feel the same about me. If it helps to know, I don't believe you've the imagination for a scheme of this size. If you have, then props to you for being a good actor. Thanks. And between ourselves, Blore, your evidence regarding the Landor case, it was made up, wasn't it? It might as well get it off your chest. We may die tonight. Oh, right. Landor was innocent. The Purcell gang wanted to get rid of him. They bribed me into making him the fall guy for that robbery. But all I did was had him set up for life. How was I to know he'd die? You didn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here today. A sitting target. <clears throat> I propose that if we are to save our own lives, certain steps must be taken. Might I suggest we adjourn in the drawing room in half an hour's time to talk things over? Oh dear, what's the matter? I feel giddy. Uh, delayed shock. I could give you something. No! Just as you please. I prefer to sit a while until it wears off. I still say that it's her. It's obvious she drove her maidservant to suicide, and she still finds nothing wrong with it. Hard as stone she has. She still must be in the dining room. Let's ask her to join us, but have Dr. Armstrong keep a close watch on her. <gasps> Look! Another proven innocent. Too late. That bee! The bee under the table! Didn't I tell you? That's the mark of a hypodermic syringe. I'm detecting cyanide, same as Marston. But the bumblebee! It can't be a coincidence! Our unknown soldier likes his nursery rhyme. He's a playful beast. It's all insane. We still have our reasoning powers, I hope. Who brought a syringe to the island? I did. Well, as a doctor, I always travel with one. Where is it? Come with me, I'll fetch it. What? It's gone. Someone must have taken it. There's five of us here. One of us is a murderer. Now, I suggest that anything which can be used as a weapon be locked up along with the master key. Knives, drugs, Lombard's revolver. Oh, like hell. I wanted to defend myself. But you're a big, strong man. None of us will have anything to attack you with. Oh, fine. Have it your way. It's in my room. What the? Someone took it! Wait a tick. May not know where the revolver is, but I think I know where the syringe is. Aha! Thrown out of the window with another soldier. Now how do you know where it was? Now wait a minute! Now gentlemen please! I think I know how we can move forward. From now on, for everyone's safety, we all stay together at all times. Or at the most, only one person at a time may leave the group. May I be excused? I've got a raging headache and I just want to splash some cold water on my face. It's just five minutes. You know I love you, Vera. But I can't marry you. I'm penniless. It's not fair that Cyril is inheriting his father's fortune. Smell something. The sea? The lights! The generator wasn't run today! 
Someone's in my room. Ah! Vera, Vera, what happened? I felt, I felt cold hands around my neck. Let me see. What? The, <laughs> that's seaweed. That's, that's seaweed hanging on that hook from your ceiling. It felt like cold, wet hands. Here, have some whiskey. Get away from me! <laughs> Good for you, Vera. You still have your senses. Want a fresh, unopened bottle? No! I just want water! Death by fright. That's a new one. Where's the judge? I thought he was behind us. He's been shot. Through the head. Is that the curtain and the wool? Fashioned into his robes and wig. <laughs> no more pronouncing for old Justice Wargrave. <laughs> oh, if only Edward Seaton could see him now. <laughs> only yesterday you said he was the killer. <sighs> I was wrong. If he was shot, where's that revolver? Who's there? Armstrong! Blor? What is it? Armstrong's not in his room. Vera, stay in your room until both Blor and I speak to you. Understand? Okay. Where did you- I found it back in my drawer. I don't expect you to believe me, but it's true. Now, let's find the mad doctor. No sign of him anywhere. And there's only three little soldier boys left. I say he's got the wind up and took the easy way out. Then where's his body? I don't think I'm the one you should ask. He could have been chucked into the sea by someone. By whom? You or me? You were the one that heard him go outside. And who returned your revolver, Lombard? Or did you have it all the time? None of it makes sense. That's why you should see I'm not lying. Why wouldn't I come up with a better lie than that? Oh, would you two stop behaving like idiots? Have you forgotten the rhyme? Four little soldier boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one. That is the vital clue. Armstrong is still alive. He took away the China soldier to make us think he's dead. But his disappearance is just the red herring across the track. I suppose you're right. Anyway, if he's still here, he'll have hard luck with the next verse. Three little soldiers walking in the zoo. And there's no bear in the island. Don't you understand? We've been acting like animals. We're the zoo. Someone ought to see that. Let's not go back to the house. It feels safer out here. Not a bad idea. We will need to go back for the night. It's getting on for lunchtime. I could do without any food. Same. I'm not sure I can do any more tinned meat. Well, I need my meals three a day. You two stay here. Now, we agreed not to separate. But if you want, I can accompany you. No, but if I'm going... If you think I'm going to lend you my revolver, you're even madder than the doctor. You can either go as you are, or I can accompany you. No, you stay put. I'll be back. Feeding time at the zoo. Do you think he's taking a risk going out on his own? No. Armstrong doesn't have the revolver. And Blor is twice the size as him. Don't you get the feeling that we're being watched all the time? That's just nerves. Anyway, there's only one other person to be afraid of, and that's Blor. He's more cunning than he looks. Is that the only other option? Well, don't you trust me? I suppose I'd have to, otherwise... What? I still think it's Armstrong. He's somewhere, watching and waiting. That's not nerves. 
That's your conscience. You did let that kid drown, didn't you? No! <laughs> of course. Why did you do it? There was a man, wasn't there? Did you hear that? So we're next. That settles it. Armstrong is hiding in the house. Let's go back to the beach. From there we can see him wherever he comes. It's a pity we can't take a dip. What is that? Looks like somebody's clothes. It's not clothes, it's a man! Armstrong. He's been dead for hours. That means, don't move or I'll shoot! Now I know the truth. Oh, you know the truth. This is the end, you understand? The end of the game. Now come on, Vera. Hand over the gun. Give it back to me! You're behind the times, my little friends. You can come with me, little one. We've won, my dear. One little soldier boy left all alone. How did it end? Oh yes, he got married, and then there were none. It's not fair that Cyril is inheriting his father's fortune. He's a nice kid. <gasps> Miss Claythorne, I want to swim out to the rock! You can swim as far as the rock. And even further if you want. it for you, Hugo. Why did you hold it against me? Why? story is incredible, Inspector Main. Ten people dead and not one living soul on the island. It doesn't make any sense. Nevertheless, it happened, Sir Thomas. But someone must have killed them. All of them died in a violent manner. Poisonings, gunshots, fractured skulls, even a hanging. As if that weren't disturbing enough, we found a gramophone record accusing all of them, directly or indirectly, of murder. It seems their killer was a fanatic for justice. Yet no one can trace you and Owen. Our only possible lead was Isaac Morris. And he died on the same night that the boat left for the island. That's too perfectly timed. Not like he would have given us anything. He was in a dope business after all. Well, regardless, Owen performed the first class vanishing trick into thin air. Damn it, there must be an explanation. The victims all left behind diaries and notes. They all correlate a few facts. You and Owen was never on the island. And even if he were, he couldn't have left without a boat. The only possible explanation is that you and Owen was one of the ten. Well, what else do the notes say? Up to a certain point, the deaths took place in this order. 
Anthony Marston, Ethel Rogers, General MacArthur, Thomas Rogers, Miss Brent, and Justice Wargrave. Afterwards, Vera Claythorne's diary states that Dr. Armstrong left the house in the night and that Bloor and Lombard went after him. So then, we've checked the most plausible theory. We already know Armstrong had drowned. Suppose he went mad, killed his nine companions, and either committed suicide by jumping into sea, or he drowned while trying to swim ashore. Something tells me it isn't that simple. That solution fails on one ground. The forensic expert reached the island on August 13th. According to him, these people had been dead for at least 36 hours or longer. But one thing he is certain of is this. Armstrong had been in the water for 8 to 10 hours. That places his drowning on the night of August 10th or 11th, the highest tide after the storm. Armstrong could not have killed the others before throwing himself into the sea because his body was dragged up above the high water mark. It was laid out and stretched on the ground, neat and tidy. That means someone was alive on the island after Armstrong was dead. So that leaves us with three remaining suspects. Philip Lombard, Vera Claythorne, and our own ex-inspector Bloor. Lombard was shot in the heart. His body was down by the sea near Armstrong's. Vera was found hanging in her bedroom and Bloor was out on the terrace. His head was crushed in by that giant bear statue that was made out of marble. Suppose Lombard pushed that statue onto Bloor, then doped Vera and strung her up, went down to the beach and shot himself. If that's the case, who took the revolver away from him? We found it on the landing outside of Walgrave's room. Fingerprints, Vera's. But man alive, that means... I know what you'll say, sir. That Vera killed them all and committed suicide. We found marks of seaweed on the chair in her room, similar to that on her shoes. This suggests that she used that chair to kick away as she hanged herself. But when we found her in that room, the chair wasn't kicked over. It was neatly put back against the wall by someone else after Vera's death. Well, that leaves us with Bloor. Sir, if you tell me that Bloor shot Lombard, hung Vera, and then maneuvered that statue to fall onto himself, I simply wouldn't believe you. No one commits suicide that way. Besides, we knew Bloor, and he was not suicidal. But someone else was on the island then. Someone who tied it up once his macabre job was over. But where was he the whole time, and where did he go? The Sticklehaven people are certain that no one else could have left the island before the rescue boat got there. So who killed them? Excuse me, sir. This document was found in the sea by the captain of the Emma Jane, the fishing trawler. Yes, sir? You may want to come in here. I've always had an incurably romantic imagination. When reading adventure stories as a child, I was always thrilled by the idea of sealing important documents into a bottle and casting it into the sea to the mercy of the waves. That is why I am adopting this course in the chance that one day, my written confession will explain the unsolved mysteries of the ten murders on Soldier Island. Right from my early youth, I realized that my nature was a mass of contradictions. I always enjoyed seeing or causing death, but at the same time, I've always felt strongly that justice should prevail. As a judge, seeing an innocent person in the dock gave me no pleasure. I always made sure that people I sentenced to death were guilty. Such was the case with Edward Seaton. He took advantage of an elderly lady and brutally murdered her. It was then that I hatched my plan to punish those who had committed murder in such a way that the law could not touch them. Around this time, a nursery rhyme which had fascinated me as a boy came back into my mind. The Ten Little Soldier Boys. I began to collect my victims. I learned from a nurse that Dr. Armstrong had killed a patient by operating under the influence of alcohol. A conversation between two retired army officers put me on General MacArthur's trail. Then I came to know about Philip Lombard's activities from the Amazon. 
A conversation with one of my doctors led me onto the trail of Thomas and Ethel Rogers. Then there was the episode involving Emily Brent and her wretched servant girl. Anthony Boston I selected from a wide variety of similar cases of hit and runs. His lack of remorse and inability to feel responsible for the accident he caused made him dangerous and unfit to live. As for Blore, I was already aware of the Landor case and took a serious view of the events. Finally, I heard about Vera Claythorne from a young man called Hugo Hamilton, whose nephew had been encouraged to swim out of his depth and drown. And so I had my nine victims. I needed a tenth. Then my Harley Street doctor diagnosed that I was unwell. Terminally. I immediately resolved not to submit to a slow and painful death, but to go out in a blaze of excitement. I would be the tenth victim. I was able to buy Soldier Island, and in the name of the fictitious Mr. Owen, I concocted suitable bait with the help of a shady lawyer named Isaac Morris. He'd been responsible for a death due to his dope peddling, so killing him was no real moral dilemma. Once he was taken care of, I meticulously planned the order of the deaths of my guests. I calculated this based upon certain degrees of guilt. Those with the least amount of guilt should die first, reserving the psychological torture I had in store for the more cold-blooded offenders. Marston's crime, while amoral, was pure recklessness. Mrs. Rogers was bullied by her husband. And so it was potassium cyanide in Marston's glass and an overdose of chloral hydrate in the brandy that Rogers gave his wife. General MacArthur, who I feared had suffered enough, did not hear me come up behind him and died painlessly. For my plan to continue to work, I needed an accomplice. And Dr. Armstrong seemed the most suited to the task, as it was inconceivable to him that a person of my standing could possibly be a murderer. I revealed my strategy to trap the murderer, and he was completely taken in. On the morning of August 10th, I killed Rogers while he was chopping wood. During the confusion that it caused, I pinched Lombard's revolver from his room. After breakfast, it was easy to give a shot of cyanide to Miss Brent. Bringing a bumblebee into the room may have seemed childish, but I was enjoying sticking to the nursery rhyme. I had safely hidden away the revolver and used up all the cyanide. I suggested to Armstrong we should simulate my death, which I said would enable us to trap the murderer. And he liked the idea. A bit of red mud plastered on my forehead, the red curtain, the wool fashioned into a wig, and some low lighting were all we needed. Everything worked out beautifully. Dr. Armstrong played his role to perfection. I was carried to my room after which everyone just forgot about me. It gave me the chance to put the revolver back in Lombard's room before they went to bed. Later, I agreed to meet Armstrong at the edge of the cliff at two o'clock in the morning. I gave him a quick push and he lost his balance. Then came the moment I had been waiting for. Three frightened people left on the island. I watched them from the terrace above. When I saw Blore coming alone, I pushed the loose bear statue right onto him. Exit Blore. From there, I saw Vera shoot Lombard. I then immediately set the stage up in her bedroom and arranged the noose accordingly. It was an interesting psychological experiment. The tension of having just shot a man, the guilt of her own crime, and hypnotic power of the scene. Would all of this have been enough to drive her to suicide? I was right. And now for the last stage. Once I finish writing my story, I shall put these pages in a sealed bottle and throw it into the sea. Now the question is, why? It was my ambition to invent a murder mystery that no one could solve. But no artist can be satisfied with art alone. Every artist thirsts for recognition. Even while writing my confession, I hope that the mystery of Soldier Island remains unsolved, but the police know that Edward Seaton was guilty and may therefore figure it out. If one of the 10 people on the island was not a murderer in any sense of the word, then the innocent person must logically be the murderer who craved justice. The matter of my own death will leave a mark on my forehead. The mark of Cain, the curse of a killer. I have little else to say. After enclosing my message in the bottle and consigning it to the waves, 
I shall go up and lie down on my bed. I shall wind the black elastic cord from my reading glasses around the door handle and loosely tie the other end to the revolver, which I shall hold in a handkerchief, careful to preserve Miss Vera Claythorne's handprints. After pulling the trigger, my hand will fall to the side and the revolver will be pulled away by the elastic onto the floor by the door. I shall be found lying neatly on my bed where the others left me yesterday. By the time we are found, no one will be able to tell who died last. They will find 10 dead bodies and an unsolvable mystery on Soto Island. Signed, Lawrence Wargrave.